Welcome to Healthcare Upside Down with your host, Dr. Nick Vanterhaven, and brought to you by ECG Management Consultants. You can learn more about the show on the program's page at healthcarenowradio.com or on our blog at ecgmc.com slash hud. The U.S. spends more on healthcare per capita than any other country on the planet. So why don't we have superior outcomes? Why haven't the principles of capitalism prevailed? And why do American consumers have so much trouble accessing and paying for healthcare? Each week, Healthcare Upside Down will dive into these and other issues with ECG principal, Dr. Nick, and guest panelists as they discuss the upsides and downsides of healthcare in the US and how to make the system work for everyone. And we end with your better pill to swallow, the conclusion to today's episode with insights on challenges and changes that improve healthcare. Now here's your host, Dr. Nick. Everyone remembers the day they receive their cancer diagnosis. It's a watershed moment in your life. Everything changes from that moment on, and there is no putting that particular genie back in the bottle. This probably explains the reluctance on the part of many to go for any kind of screening. The sinking feeling many feel as they wait for their screening mammography the perception of any delay that is always interpreted as a problem, and then for many, the huge sense of relief and weight lightened from their shoulders when they're given the all clear one more time. But for some, that does not occur, and they can often tell as the mood is somber in the room, as the news is broken, and you sit there in disbelief, and your mind tries to process the information as your emotions run amok. So imagine being homeless and discovering you have cancer. You already live on the edge of control, struggling to manage your life, and now you have another huge burden and likely limited support from family and friends. Your connection to the digital age is through a phone provided by a program that offers a free phone for the homeless. Add to this that screening for the disease is an integral part of medicine, and even prior to the pandemic shutdown, uptake was variable, and with many not accessing and some avoiding screening activities. The pandemic has undoubtedly made this worse, with many either being unable to access care and screening because of the overwhelmed healthcare system, and most agree we can expect to see a rise in the general disease burden on our community, and probably a later stage diagnosis of cancer in more people. We already have challenges in humanizing healthcare in general, with the move to digitization and the expansion of telehealth services that's seen as essential to creating more affordable and wider access. But this is especially true in the highly charged area such as oncology or cancer care. Is it possible to offer a digitally enabled oncology service, or as Adam puts it, an empathetic engine to deliver essential human psychosocial support? Everything is personalized with data, tuned with technology, but at the right moment in time, the human connection moves front and center. Join me on the Healthcare Upside Down show as I talk with Adam Pellegrini, the co-founder and CEO of Jasper Health, who has been building digital health solutions for years with a wide range of organizations and is now focused on creating an empathetic digital service for oncology patients that can scale. Hi, Adam. Welcome to the show. Well, hello, Dr. Nick. Thanks for having me. So you've set up a new company, Jasper Health. You're focused on uh, oncology, cancer care. You're digitizing everything, right? Yes, it's uh, it's a digital oncology platform. Uh, we uh, have almost 3,000 members. Uh, we, we choose uh, to consider our patients members because cancer doesn't define them. So we have almost 13,000 members on the platform today that we provide um, psychosocial support. Um, think about diet, fitness, nutrition, um, an ear to talk to, uh, um, as well as medication adherence and other psychosocial elements um, that are sometimes missing in the cancer journey. So I, as I'm listening to you, it sounds like there's more to it than just a platform and a digital component. What's going on there? Because whenever we talk about cancer, and in fact, one of the challenges that I think we have in society, it's even true in medicine, let's be clear, just mentioning the word cancer was actually 
I, it wasn't verboten, but it, it was considered, you know, you try and skirt around it, find another way to say. Um, so uh, there's something else going on in this, right? Absolutely. So back in the early 2000s, uh, where I established some of my initial gray hairs, um, I actually was with the American Cancer Society and, and building cancer.org. Um, through that process, I think we did almost... Uh, you know, four or 5,000 interviews with cancer patients and caregivers, um, anthropological analysis, and, and it all came down to the same thing. Back in the 50s, 60s, the word cancer itself was taboo. Um, we've grown to accept that it, it, it's okay to talk about it throughout the 70s and 80s. And now what we're embracing is the fact that we need to, to not have anything be taboo, but we need to, to deliver empathy um, and support for those um, that are going through cancer. And so um, it, it really was sort of, it's an evolution of the space. Um, for, for Jasper Health, um, it was uh, incubated out of Redesign Health um, uh, in 2020. Um, initially, the idea was more of a direct-to-consumer model. Um, but at, when I joined, we basically changed the direction of the company to be focused on creating a B2B healthcare platform for oncology. However, we kept that consumer channel open um, simply because we were helping thousands and thousands of, of members every single day. Um, and I didn't want to turn that off. So it's a free service um, that we continue to support, even though our main focus is delivering a, a B2B digital oncology platform to payers. So if you've got a free service, how are you managing to deliver on that? Which is, I, I know it's been one of your ideals and one of the sort of targets for the organization. But that sounds like an economic challenge. It is. Um, uh, you know, it's it's something that I am pretty passionate about, though. Um, you know, to me, I, I, with, I'm a healthcare person. I started, as, as you know, as a, a, a medic and an OR tech in the Army. This is, I, I, I didn't just uh, get into digital health because I loved, um, you know, digital stuff. Um, I, I can't, with a conscious, not have that service available. Um, some of the stories are incredible. Um, uh, and, and so to me, it's, it's almost like this is what you do if you're coming into healthcare. Now, the reality is it does align to the B2B strategy. I actually consider it a C to B2B strategy. Um, because if you think about it, all of those members um, and their caregivers probably have an employer or a health plan or a health system. So step one is I could connect them to our existing partners. Um, and so we're providing now this patient engagement experience that's highly sticky. And if the patient wants to connect to their local hospital, their oncologist, their health plan to find, to unlock, if you will, new resources and services, they can do that. And to the B2B partners, that's a huge value add. I mean, as you know, I spent decades on the B2B side as, a, as in big companies where it was really hard to get patient engagement. Here we have patient engagement, engagement in, in a big way. Um, and now we can connect them to our partners. So it aligns to our business model, even if it doesn't generate revenue. You know, I, I, I love the fact that that's the case. Um, you're essentially using it as a, a sort of opportunity to connect people into the right resources. But it also appears as if that's a perfect market research place to understand what's necessary. What kind of stories are you hearing? Incredible ones. Ones that our head of uh, our chief nursing officer, uh, we, we, we hired our first chief nursing officer as our first real um, clinical leader. Um, and she actually does the consults um, herself as well, the coaching sessions. Um, she tells me she cries four times a week at a minimum because the stories are so powerful. Um, one story um, was a member of Jasper uh, through a free Android phone she got from a social service program found Jasper, uh, connected with our coach, um, and, and shared that she was homeless, living in a car, um, late stage breast cancer. Uh, she had no money whatsoever, had to take street drugs for pain, um, went to the ER. They thought she was looking for drugs so they wouldn't see her. Um, so our coach worked with her throughout this whole episode. And turns out she was, a, she was eligible for Medicaid and didn't even know what Medicaid was. And so that was like a mind blown, are you kidding me? And, and we should, you know, I should know that there are folks out there that probably are eligible for Medicaid, but just don't even know what the word means. 
Um, so we connected her to the local, to the state Medicaid program. Um, so she can actually get resources and services. Um, that didn't take sophisticated clinical technology. That took talking and dialogue and listening to the problems and then actually trying to go out there and solve the problems. Jasper has almost 50 nonprofit cancer partners now. Um, you know, folks like Gilda's Club, um, Emmerman Angels. Um, so all of those resources from all of our partners now we put into a database. Um, and then we end up sharing those with our, our customers specific to their needs, specific to their geography. Yeah, so, I, I, you know, healthcare is about humanity and adding that humanity back into it. I, I would challenge anybody to hear a story like that and not be a little bit choked up. I mean, that's just a, a sad indictment. But I think what's interesting to me as you tell that story is the fact that that was ultimately unnecessary. I mean, I think we're, I, I'm certainly guilty of it, of going, well, the system's wrong, it failed. But actually, the system had the resources, there was a solution there. It just wasn't connected. It wasn't connecting. To allow for that individual to access and, you know, be treated with the humanity and compassion that we all want to deliver. So you're obviously bringing things together in a way that is allowing for that. You're using technology, but my sense is that technology is, I, I don't know, is that the second player or is second fiddle, let's call it, or is that the pro? How do you see all of that? Yeah, I've always believed in this idea of exception-based care management, um, dating back to when uh, Jim Malt and I built out Healthy Circles. Um, I, you know, that's where I got my first sort of exposure to this idea of risk stratification, exception management, red, yellow, green. Um, and so we use exception management as well from a more psychosocial perspective. There are some folks that just want to text. There are some folks that don't even want to talk to you. They've got it. Uh, and just provide them education and resources and nudges. You know, Jasper has um, a nudge engine that we can actually use our personalization and recommendation engines to push nudges uh, on resources and services to members. Um, some, some folks just want to have that. They're in the green. It's the folks that are not comfortable with technology. It's the folks that need a listening ear. Um, it's the folks that need really complex navigation. They're in the red. And then that's when the human empathy and the coaching comes into play. It, it's interesting. Someone uh, at Time listed us um, as one of the four companies really sort of delivering on virtual care um, from CES. I never took this role thinking that Jasper was a virtual care company. Um, I took the role thinking that Jasper is an empathetic engine to deliver, you know, essentially psychosocial support that's a wrapper around the clinical protocols for oncology. That's why I joined Jasper. But if you look at it, we're doing video asynchronous, um, you know, psychosocial care delivery uh, every single day. So yeah, it, we, we are doing virtual care in a way. So I think what I see it is we have a very sophisticated um, set of engines underneath, a personalization recommendation engines, a nudge engine um, that, that uses this data that comes in to personalize that whole journey for our members. But the layer of empathy is where I think we're unique because that's where we have coaches, dietitians, nutritionists making meal plans, um, those type of things that are often gaps in the care protocol. Um, that's where we're focusing um, our, our, our human care advocates. So I know you're familiar with this. Um, you know, we hear it repeatedly in the healthcare sector, but there's a lot of pushback around the amount of spend at the tail end of people's lives. That's where, you know, the biggest spend. And to be clear, not always the most appropriate use of limited resources. Um, and that's not me saying you shouldn't have the care, but that's maybe not the right choice. You know, I might make a different choice, but the system is sort of designed that way. Are you addressing that or are you just feeding more of this care that maybe is not the most appropriate choice? I think that there's a lot of things that can be done. First of all, when we when Jasper was incubated, it only the only focus was newly diagnosed patient, um, patients. And as I said, we call them, we, we consider everyone members. Um, 
12%, we found out 12% of our new members to Jasper are actually in remission and survivorship. We never knew that. Nothing, we built nothing to support remission and survivorship. Mm -hmm. So once we found that stat out, um, again, all the insights from the direct to consumer channel told us that, the voice of the customer, right? We started building out remission support. And then we started really digging into remission. Um, and even in, even things around end of life, there's, there's some things that you can do and can, some things you can't do. But one thing you can do, especially in remission, is you could still coach, you could still provide psychosocial support services, um, and you could still early detect, and I don't mean prevention detection, I mean early detect of critical issues that could be coming using the biometric data psych and the EPRO data and the clinical data combined. And so to me, I, I, I look at it more as our job is, you know, people are going through the worst experience of their lives right here. We need to be there for them. People in remission or, or members in remission, um, they, they're they always worried about the next, you know, foot to drop. I've heard it so many times from our members. I'm just waiting for the next shoe to drop. Um, we, we did, the, 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 you know, it, 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 it probably 2,000 interviews with our members um, to get sort of feedback and voice of the customer that rang out completely true. So we want to provide that layer across the entire continuum um, from new diagnosis all the way through remission. Um, and, and we'll continue to go and, and listen to the customer to see where they want us to support more. I think from a, from a cost, um, you know, from a cost perspective, if you look at it from a payer's perspective or from an employer's perspective, you know, preventing ED visits that lead to, you know, very expensive inpatient acute visits, um, that's where we're focusing from an ROI intervention. Because again, we could do, those things are not mutually exclusive. They're actually aligned quite nicely. If we have EPRO data, biometric data, like Fitbit wearables, um, Apple Watch, all of this kind of risk stratified red, yellow, green, we can actually help people uh, or members get to care earlier um, and prevent some of these more costly episodes from happening. Yeah, I, and to be fair, I think as I'm listening to you, what I'm not hearing is it's all about the clinical intervention, the high cost intervention. I heard food, I heard homelessness. I'm, I'm sure yeah. even potentially an addressing of that. The cost associated with taking unregulated street drugs and the potential risk of HIV, Hep C, you name it. Yeah. All of that is a sort of, that's a saving. It would be a downstream cost that didn't occur. So I, 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 I see that entirely. I, as I look at this and I think about the necessity of it, uh, are, we, are we approaching a point where we're going to see, see more openness to the discussion? I mean, are, are people welcoming this or is this? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think as long as it fits into the context in which they are looking at this space and, and a lot of health plans are looking at the same things we are. They just call, they may have specific definitions. So are we helping uh, from a SDOH perspective? perspective? Absolutely. Um, are we helping from uh, a health equity perspective? Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's deep in our, that's deep into the pillars of our focus. Um, are we also looking at, I mean, the simple things like patient engagement, Right. I mean, that's every health plan is for member engagement, every, you know, they, they've been doing it since we all started this digital health stuff in the early, you know, in the late 1990s. Right. They, everyone's been searching for that. Um, so it, as long as it fits into the buckets in which they are actually prioritizing, then they're absolutely open to it. Um, the most uh, openness to it actually have been the oncologists that we've spoken to. Um, so much, and, you know, part of my job is just listening to her is with oncologists. Um, and one head oncologist of a major health system told me, I would love every single one of my doctors to have them download their patients, download Jasper when they find out uh, a new diagnosis. And I said, well, why is that? Because in between appointments, it could be two to three weeks before we talk to a, a patient after we give them the diagnosis. Um, and, and, the, and the oncologist said, I can't tell you how many times I've got my ear chewed off because I have not even contacted someone three weeks later after I told them they have cancer. And, 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 and the, the oncologist is like, it's not because I don't want to, it's because I have, I'm just overworked. I just have too, a huge patient load um, that I can't get back to everyone. So if I can have a co-pilot 
um, that can focus on the psychosocial support around that, it's a blessing. Um, as a matter of fact, it's a blessing has been said so many times by our members. It, if you put, if you, it, the feedback wise, it would be in a word cloud and it would be the largest piece of the word cloud. Um, so, I mean, you know, it, it's it's a rewarding mission focused role. And, and again, it goes back to, you know, that having this free resource with these free care advocates, you know, I, I, sometimes it doesn't mean that you need to make a business model out of it. Sometimes you just need to do what's right. Um, and you need to and, and do what you the reason why we all got into healthcare in the first place. I'll let the B2B side subsidize that all day long. So I, the nudges that you talk about clearly necessary in some mm -hmm. places. My my understanding from a patient standpoint is there's no nudge necessary for them once they're on the sort of treadmill of I have cancer. But it sounds like this works from all parties that you've got technology that essentially helps support that and delivers the sort of arm holding. But it's it's more than that, I think, with Jasper. It's not just the digital piece piece of this. It's it's all of that to support everybody in the space. Is is that that's right? Exact, that's exactly right. So for example, um, we just launched um, a clinical trial matching service. Um, not because we thought this was a, a new market we should go into. I mean, I've been I've known about clinical trial matching since Microsoft back in 2005 or, or so, or even earlier. Um, it's because our members asked for it. Um, and they're like, I heard about this clinical trial stuff. So we ended up launching a, you know, our care advocates do an actual concierge human matching consults, um, not bot driven AI. I'm going to match it to this, match it to this, and then figure it out. It's actually empathetic trial matching. We had one member who didn't even know what a clinical trial was. We got him and he was depressed. He was suicidal. We got him all the way to an actual trial. And whether or not he goes through it or whatever is, is, is going to be up to him. But the emotional uplift within a week from changing from super depressed to I have hope. And that's literally what he said to our care advocate. I have hope. Uh, now, um, that was huge, right? It was huge. So, uh, you know, to me, um, it, it really is addressing this empathy piece. Um, now, our goal is to be able to deliver empathy at scale. Um, right now, we have almost 13,000 members on our platform at a 1% prevalence rate. That's the size of like a million member health plan. So it's a lot of folks. And we use exception management again to be able to manage that with a small uh, team. Um, but I think as we grow and grow and grow, we'll continue to look at how do we automate those things that can be automated um, and then make sure that that nice layer of empathy sits on top of everything. You know, back at in my days in retail pharmacy, like at Walgreens, we used to say we put an API on top of the store. Um, you know, now what we say at Jasper is we put empathy on top of the API. And that's the that's going to be, I think, the real um, sort of power of this platform. You, you know, I, I, as I think about this, I'm, I'm just really struck by the notion that we've got this exploding number of cases. I think everybody, or yeah. maybe not everyone, but the, the vast majority view a, a burgeoning problem of people that were undiagnosed, delayed treatment, delayed, you know, screening. So we're going to see increasing numbers yeah. who are later stage disserviced, um, and you know. One of the primary responsibilities that I have as a, uh, a clinician to friends is to serve as that clinical trials identifier. Yeah. And here you are essentially delivering. I think empathy at scale is an exciting proposition. Adam, thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. Accompanying people on some of their most vulnerable journeys and experiences is a taxing experience and one that requires empathy and compassion. These are the things that are hard to deliver with technology, but using technology as a supporting act and as a tool to filter and allow for the most appropriate application of the scarce human resource using exception-based management makes it possible. Recognizing the fact that we all have our own filter and preferences for the support and interaction and the connection points that can vary by individual and then matching and seeking the preferred channel that creates the least friction for that individual. Your better pill to swallow 
is the targeted use of technology, using digital enablement to empower your staff to remove the friction in their work and the friction in their ability to deliver more empathy at scale. Exception-based individualized care management can be achieved, allowing for the most appropriate use of your staff to deal with your patients, your members, your partners in the healthcare journey. Thanks for joining me, your host, Dr. Nick, on this week's edition of Healthcare Upside Down. Until next week, keep solving the business of healthcare as if your life depended on it. As one day soon, it will. That's all the time we have for today. You can find all of our episodes on your favorite listening platform by searching for Healthcare Now Radio. Also, check out our blog at ecgmc.com slash hud for summaries and commentary from each episode. Follow our show's social hashtag, HC Upside Down. And join us each week as we work to solve the business of healthcare for everyone.